Okay, for those of you just joining us, uh, so we're getting started here. And uh, just so you know, I, I know I gave you a schedule last week before we came back from spring break, and I went over some highlights of it on Monday. Um, you know, guys, I'm <clears throat> I'm doing this for the first time also, so I'm in the same place you guys are, uh, kind of like experimenting. And so uh, I want to try my best to cover the material that we're supposed to cover. Uh, I don't know if we'll, if we'll be able to finish today. Now, the exam still stands, okay? So um, let's go back to uh, our Canvas page here. I want to make sure that everybody's on the same on board here. Here. So once more, this is where we show you like a little simulation of the uh, right of the Canvas page, right? And uh, again, please remember that uh, you have. <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> my voice is kind of failing me a little bit here. Couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, one of them, of course, is that there is a lab activity that you have to be working on, and it's right here, Experiment 11. So make sure that you are on top of that. It is a fairly long activity, and it includes several videos and several steps. You had to make a few graphs. So please don't wait till the last minute to work on this, okay? Uh, also, we moved our quiz that was originally scheduled for yesterday. We moved it to tomorrow because we didn't get to finish all the material on Monday. So I want to make sure you guys have uh, a good foundation for it. And don't forget your thermal chemistry homework is due uh, by, uh, actually it says here by Friday, but it'll be available through the weekend in case you don't get, you don't get to finish on time. You can do that. Now, I did want to point out uh, over here, I have opened a new module. And that's for exam number two. Let's come down here, right past the thermochemistry unit. Here it is. And what you'll have here is you have your exam study guide. All right. So please download this file. And like it says here, remember, this is a guide. It's not a template. It's not like those are the questions that are going to be showing up on the exam. It's just a guide in terms of topics, what you need to focus on, what are some things you need to know? What are some things that you don't have to memorize? For example, you don't have to memorize the solubility table. Uh, you don't have to know how to name acids, uh, but you should be able to recognize an acid and use a solubility table. And just be aware that on the day of the exam, before you open it, you are gonna have to fill out a form where you agree to abide by the school's academic honesty policy. Uh, let me show you a little bit of what that's going to look like. Now, I'm going to borrow here from a colleague of mine. Uh, I think this is from her class. Uh, so you're going to have something that looks like this, all right? Uh, so when you open it, this is, again, like I said, this is a different exam, different class. It's not our class. <clears throat> but it's going to look like this. It's going to say a message that you had to read and electronically sign the academic integrity statement. So you're going to open this and sign it which basically means putting your name in there in two different places. <clears throat> and what will happen is until you have completed that step, the exam will not open for you. All right. So you won't be able to take the exam unless you have signed this form, which basically means you agree to abide to the school's academic honesty policy. So there are some rules uh, that you have to follow here. OK, uh, you know, no, no looking for answers on the Internet, <clears throat> no trying to, you know, find if there's somebody has a previous exam that looks like this one you can find the answers uh, that kind of stuff okay so i just want you to be aware of that all right <clears throat> okay so uh we started our study of quantum chemistry <clears throat> excuse me on monday and we left it at a point where we found out <clears throat> that one of the things that was proposed at the beginning of the 20th century was that light had the property of sometimes behaving as a wave and sometimes behaving as a particle. And the photoelectric effect explained by Einstein was the one that essentially <clears throat> put the nail in the coffin of light being just purely electromagnetic radiation. <clears throat> so many of the properties of electrons, for example, in the Bohr atom, <clears throat> atom I'm sorry, we talked about how Bohr Niel Bohr proposed that the hydrogen atom had electrons essentially orbiting the nucleus in specific discrete orbits with quantized or discrete levels of energy. 
<clears throat> but that you could transition from one level to another by pumping in energy, let's say electricity, and then the electrons would fall back to a more stable state and in the process release that energy they had absorbed in the form of light. But the question was, why is the atom organized that way? So the proposal came, let's go to our, uh, I'm sorry, let's go to our uh, PowerPoint here, uh, if I can find it. No, oh, here we go. And the proposal was that much like light has dual nature, so does the electron. Now you gotta understand, up to this point, uh, it was believed and accepted that the atom was made of these three subatomic particles, neutrons, protons uh, that were clumped in the nucleus, and then electrons that were somewhere out there outside the nucleus. Now Bohr was proposing the electrons were essentially orbiting the nucleus. But the idea here was, you know, what if electrons in the same way as light actually have properties both of particles and of uh, light? And so let me get to our markers here, okay? So the question was, you know, why would the energy of electrons be quantized? Why would they not exist over a whole spectrum of different energies, all right? So in 1924, Louis de Broglie reasoned that just like light, the electron is both particle and wave. Now, what kind of a wave is what's important here, all right? So I'm gonna borrow here from the, uh, uh, you know, the structure of a guitar, all right? Now, when we talked about waves last time, we usually assume we're talking about something that is source at some point and then travels through space, like for example, light coming from the sun to the earth, or let's say the waves in the ocean going from the horizon all the way to the shore. But in a guitar, what happens is that you have a string that can vibrate and the vibration of that string translates into the vibration of the air molecules around it, which get, then gets transmitted as a sound wave, right? So let's look at a guitar very quickly, how a guitar is made, oh, sorry. Gotta make sure these things work here. Okay, so this is the body of a guitar, and those of you who are familiar with guitars, some of you actually play guitar. I used to play guitar. Uh, I haven't played like in six years or so, and my guitar actually is uh, kind of buried deep into a, storage unit that we had to open last year when we were going to sell our house and i have not retrieved it yet uh, but anyway of course the idea is that uh, as you can see here the uh, body of the guitar is essentially a box and then there's a long arm here that has where the strings are attached and there's a fretboard and essentially you press down and therefore you shorten the distance over which the string vibrates right so that's the way it works so if we look at it, there's several ways that you can change the notes, right, uh, on the guitar. So one of them is the six strings on the guitar have different thicknesses. You can hear, see here from right to left, you go from the first to the sixth string, you can see how they're progressively thicker. They're also sometimes made of different materials, so they have different densities, which means they vibrate at different frequencies. So let's see how that works. If we look at here at a, uh, let me take you to this uh, little uh, website here. And uh, let's play with, so, uh, you know what? Let me make sure that um, this is gonna work. Here, hold on a second. Computer sound, okay, got it. All right. So for example, here what I'm gonna show you is what happens when you plug the string going from the first through the sixth string, notice from thinner to thicker, all right? So here comes first string. Second string. Third string. Fourth string. Obviously, what you can 
tell is that as you go through a progressively thicker string, you get a lower pitch of the note. And that's basically because what the string is doing, it's vibrating between you know, the bridge, the, the two ends of it, and the faster the vibration, in other words, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. But because the thicker strings are thicker, they don't vibrate as fast, and therefore they generate a lower pitch sound. Now, another way of doing this, again, is to shorten the distance over which the string vibrates. So when I press down on these frets, essentially I'm forcing the string to vibrate between you know, the bridge there and just the you know, uh, place where my fingers are pressing down. That means that now the string travels a shorter distance and therefore can vibrate more times in the same amount of time. In other words, higher frequency, which like we said, translates into a higher pitch sound, right? So if we go back to this, uh, again, going back to this uh, web page here, and uh, let me find a different one that I had in here. If I can find it, here we go. So what I'm gonna do here, again, remember we heard the first string here, right? So this is the first string here. Now let's see what happens if I hold a fret on, on the fifth fret. And here's on the 12th. So you can see how, again, let me do that again. I think I just, just picked the wrong one here. Just a string. Fifth fret, 12th fret. So you can see that as I shorten the distance over which the vibration happens, I get a higher pitch sound. That's because you have a higher frequency. So this phenomenon is what is called standing waves. Notice that the wave that the string forms is actually not projecting out into you know, endless space. It's actually being held between the two limits here, right? So essentially, the idea here was that that is kind of like the type of wave that an electron has. So here's a uh, representation of these waves. So pretend, I don't know if you can see the whole animation here, but this is as if, uh, let's say pretend you have a wave coming from the left to the right, it bounces at the right end and it bounces back towards the left. And as they overlap each other, they generate this oscillation here that you see going up and down, right? Let, let me uh, isolate that just that one uh, combined wave. You can see it here. So notice that what's happening is that this string is essentially oscillating, but it's oscillating between two limits, right? And uh, what happens is that between those two limits, if you uh, adjust what is the distance between them, that tells you essentially what type of wave you can fit in there and what wavelengths you can fit. So let me show this picture over here. This shows you essentially, uh, let's say, two boundaries between which a string is vibrating, all right? Let's say the distance between the two boundaries is L. Notice that in the top one, we essentially have a wave that acts as if it is essentially going halfway, half of the wave to one end, and then perfectly bouncing back and reconnecting on the left side. Now, if we had no loss of energy, like if this were not a string, if this were like a perfect uh, wave, it would continue on forever. Notice that this wave essentially has a wavelength that is equivalent to two times the distance between these things, um, right? Notice that the second one, the second example here, has a full wave going from left to right, so it starts there, uh, at the center point and then ends up there and then bounces back and essentially can generate itself back and forth and you generate this stationary wave. The first one is what we call the fundamental uh, in, in music, this would be harmonics. And so actually uh, the vibration of a string in a guitar is actually more complex than what I showed you. Um, actually during our break, I'll play you a video so you can see all the little more details of the physics of it in case you're interested. Uh, so notice that uh, there are only certain specific wavelengths that you can fit in here. 
such that when the wave goes from one side to the other, it can bounce perfectly back and reconnect at the origin and then bounce back and forth. So there are certain uh, wavelengths that are allowed and other wavelengths that might not be allowed. So for example, it looks like uh, although a wavelength that is two thirds of the length of the string is allowed, a wavelength that is one third of that distance might not be allowed. So you know what I'm saying? All right, so uh, let's look at some other features. Notice that there are some points along here where the uh, actual amplitude of the wave is zero. We call those nodes. So a node is a, uh, a position or a, a place on the standing or stationary wave where there is zero amplitude. Also, we could rearrange these equations here. So right now I have it for every value of n, right? You can have what is the wavelength that would fit inside that uh, particular harmonic. But you could also rearrange these equations in terms of uh, what L is. Notice that in this case, we could say that L was essentially the distance of half a wavelength. And if I count in half wavelengths, the second harmonic L would be two times a half wavelength. The third harmonic would be three times a half wavelength. In other words, for every harmonic, in other words, every uh, where, where I'm trying to fit, you know, n number of waves, the length that will fit them is essentially n times a half that wavelength. So there is a direct relation between the wavelength that you can fit and the distance over which that wave can travel. That means that there's going to be several wavelengths that are not allowed. They're going to be discarded. They're going to essentially create a wave that self-destructs. All right. So here's what Louis de Broglie said. He said that the electron, like light, is both particle and a wave. Now, we just talked about an oscillating string. But in the case of the electron, remember, the idea was that the electron is orbiting around the nucleus. The Broyle was saying the way it orbits is not as a particle, but as a standing or stationary wave, except that instead of being linear over a, you know, over a linear axis, it's actually running over a circular axis. Notice that, let's say for example, in this case, let's say that I start my uh, orbit right at this point. Let's, let's call this you know, three o'clock. And I'm gonna go around the orbit until I arrive at the other end. Notice that this wavelength is such that when the orbit is completed, you end up exactly where you started. And so the wave can keep on propagating itself. On the other hand, in this case, notice where I started here, the wavelength was such that when the uh, electron finished its orbit, it did not end up at the same spot that it started. Therefore, this wave would not last one orbit. It would not be allowed. All right. Now, in the previous example, we show your relationship between the wavelength and the distance between the limits. But this is a circular one, so it has a different form of the equation. We would say essentially that in a circumference, which has a dimensions 2 pi r, where r is the radius, you would only be able to fit certain types of waves, which will be n times the wavelength. Or alternatively, we could convert that into the other equation which has lambda would be equal to 2 pi r over n. A very similar equation to the one we just studied earlier, except that this is for a circular motion. So based on this and other calculations, De Broglie came up with what we call the De Broglie equation, which is this one here. This is an equation that gives us the wavelength that would be associated with the orbit of an electron around the nucleus. All right, and let me tell you what these things are. Here, u would be the velocity of the electron. All right, and of course, uh, m would be the mass. And uh, don't forget this h here is actually, remember, 
uh, the this is Planck's constant. That's the Planck's constant. So that is essentially how the Broil made this proposal. All right. Now, I want us to spend a little time here, and I'm gonna, you know, bug you here with some heavy duty math, perhaps. Hope you don't mind uh, before we go to the next uh, slide here. So let's go ahead and see how some of these derivations can be worked up. So let me come back here to our All right, let me come back here. Hold on a second. I gotta get out of the PowerPoint. Bring us back to our doc cam. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see that. And let's see if this time we can get it to not go weird like it did last time. I guess it is going a little weird. Okay, but uh, we'll try our best. It's funny, last night in my evening class, it didn't do this. But now it's kind of like blurring out again. But don't worry, again, you'll have these things in your uh, uh, Canvas module when I upload the uh, video of the recording here. I'm sorry, the uh, video of the lecture. So uh, let's, uh, let's do a few things here. So what we're doing is comparing what happens when the electron behaves as a particle versus when it behaves as a wave. So let's do this. Let's consider a particle that is essentially oscillating, quote unquote, between two uh, boundaries, right? Oscillating between two boundaries. All right. Oh, by the way, let me. Uh, I have some guests who arrived late. I'm gonna try to get them in. All right. All right. So uh, that would be this guy. Let's say they have this. This is a particle of mass uh, m. And it's basically going back and forth, back and forth between two boundaries. Well, we know from our study of uh, energy that this particle would have a kinetic energy that is given by one half times the mass times the square of the speed or the velocity, right? Notice that in this case, this energy would have a value anywhere between uh, zero and infinity. And I'm gonna put less or equal than because technically if the particle stops and does not move, it has zero kinetic energy, right? So that's the range of the kinetic energy. Not only that, but if I were to say, what is the probability that if I take a snapshot of this particle at any point during its trajectory, what is the probability that it'll be at a given position? So let's say I do a graph and I'm gonna say this is the probability of the particle being located at a position that's gonna call it, you know, X. So let's say we can be anywhere between zero and L, which is the distance between the, uh, the two uh, boundaries. So basically it would be pretty uniform. In other words, the particle could be anywhere in here and any position in here has equal probability. So any position, equal probability. And if I did like a stop motion uh, video of this, I would be able to see the particle at any one of those positions. So if I do stop motion video, I can see 
the particle, right? Like, you know, as I know, when you have a, you watch a baseball game and they do a slow motion uh, video of the pitcher and you can see the ball slowly making its way into the catcher's mitt or into the batter's bat, <laughs> either one. And uh, you can actually stop the, uh, the film, the motion, the video there, and you can see the ball just sitting there, you know, basically floating in air, but you can see it. You can track every position that ball goes through as it travels from the pitcher's arm or hand into the catcher's mitt, right? Now, let's change the model now, all right? Let's consider now a stationary wave, okay? Let's consider now. a standing or stationary wave. Again, oscillating between the two termina. Let's, let's go ahead and use this model here, the first harmonic, all right? So here's my boundaries. And here's my wave. So it's coming in, you know, it goes up and then it goes down, right? And of course, it's going to bounce back like that. OK, according to the broil, the equation we just saw, and I think it is pronounced that way. I kind of looked it up a few years ago. But the wavelength of this thing is actually h over mv, right? So that means that the speed would be h over the mass times lambda. I'm just rearranging that equation. Remember, lambda is the Greek letter that we use to describe the wavelength, right? Now, let's see what the energy of this quote unquote wave would be. So the energy would be 1 half mv squared. So that'd be one half of M. And I'm gonna substitute this in here, H over M lambda squared. Sorry, this looks like a two, it's actually a square there. So if I kind of like clear all that out, I'm gonna end up with an expression that looks like the energy would be h squared over 2 times m times lambda squared. Now, remember this. Remember that we said, let's say for this harmonic in particular, the one where you have a wave coming one way and then coming another one. We said that essentially for these things, the wavelength was going to be always something like 2L over N, right? So in this case, because N equals 2, that means that lambda equals L. So we had derived that expression earlier on, right? So let's go ahead and plug this in here. All right. You know what? Let me uh, put some steps in here. Okay. So here is our thing. Here's that. Three four, just so you can keep the sequence of steps here. So what we're going to say here is that the energy, if I now go ahead and come in here and I take this and I plug it in here, right? I'm going to get that the energy is H squared over 2M times 2L over N squared, which ends up saying, I'm going to rearrange and solve all these squares and stuff. So I have N squared times H squared over 8ML squared.
So there's several things that come out of this, okay? Let's make some observations. A, because N has a specific number, one, two, three, etc. That tells you that E only has discrete values. In other words, the energy is quantized. Remember that if the electron behaves as a particle, the energy can have almost any value. It all depends on you know, the speed or the position where it's at. But if the electron is a wave, the energy is quantized, which is what the model of the atom was proposing, that the electrons could only have certain specific, value, specific values of energy, right? Um, secondly, According to this model, because nothing here is zero, the energy can never drop to zero. Remember that in this case, if the particle stops, the energy becomes zero because the velocity is zero. But in this case, notice that there is really no velocity term in here. It doesn't have anything to do with how fast this thing is traveling. So therefore, because of that, then that means that the electron doesn't collapse. Into the nucleus. This is pretty cool. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get another piece of paper here. And I'm going to expand on this again. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to write this equation again that we just did. Okay, so we said E equals N squared. Oops, sorry, went too far up. N squared times H squared over 8 M L squared. Okay, so point number C. Let's see what these values are. Let's take, for example, for n equals 1. So that would be technically 1 squared h squared over 8ml squared. Remember, that's the, that's the lowest value you can have. You can't have anything that goes uh, you know, to 0. It doesn't go to 0. So e2 essentially would be. Two squared h squared a m l squared. But since all of this unit is E1, so this means that this would be four times the energy of the fundamental harmonic. E3, if you continue extending this, would be essentially three squared, so nine times the initial harmonic. Right? So in other words, if I were to do a diagram of these energies, let's say I start here at n equals 1. Notice that they don't, uh, they don't, incre they don't increase in uh, you know, typical multiples. So the first one, the first difference is four times what this is so over here. But the next one is going to be, you know, a little more than two times the previous one. The next one is going to be much less than twice this one. So, right? So you can see that it generates exactly the same energy diagram that Bohr's atom had. So it's the same energy diagram as Bohr's. 
The difference is that in this case, the energy has been calculated from a study of the harmonics of an oscillating wave versus from uh, Bohr essentially plugging in numbers he got from, remember I told you about the studies of Reitberg and Ballmer, just basically kind of like uh, hammering in equations, making them work. Okay, the other thing that you see is, notice that the energy also, Um, depends on L. So imagine if the wave is oscillating uh, in different boundaries, so if different atoms, oops, sorry, put this up. If different atoms have different L, which remember, we are in this case kind of like trying to make an analogy between a particle, uh, a, I'm sorry, a wave oscillating in one dimension. But remember in the atom, we're talking about an electron oscillating in a circular dimension. So this would mean that different atoms have different ways of confining their electrons. So it's different atoms have different wave patterns. And therefore, they're going to have a different uh, emission spectra. Remember, we talked about last time how different, you know, you have helium, you have neon, you have hydrogen, they have different spectra. Well, of course, if different atoms have different L, which means probably size, you are going to get different spectra. And maybe that's why the uh, model of Bohr could not predict the emission spectra of other atoms, but it still works. In other words, at least within these confines, it still works. All right. Okay, let me get a few seconds to absorb that. I know that's, that was a lot of math. And let's come back to one more thing and then we'll take a short break, okay? Let's come back to our PowerPoint here. Okay, so this is what we said was that uh, according to the Broyle, the reason why the energy of the electron is quantized is because it's behaving as a standing wave uh, oscillating on a circular trajectory for which there are limited wavelengths that you can uh, associate with it and therefore limited energy levels. So that's why the energy is quantized. Now, of course, here's the question you're gonna ask. Uh, how come we don't see that? In other words, you're, you're telling me that everything that we're made of, you know, these atoms, they behave as waves. And other than the expression, you know, cool wave or que buena onda that we say, you know, other than that, we don't see any wave properties in matter. Everything we see behaves as, you know, classical physics predicts. So let's see uh, if we can apply. Um, yeah. ah, let's see if we can apply this. Okay, let's consider a ping pong ball. What would be the wavelength? of a ping pong ball, 2.5 grams, traveling at about 35 miles per hour, which is 15.6 uh, meters per second, which, uh, by the way, I looked up at the record. The official record is somewhere around 70 miles per hour. That's as fast as somebody has been able to hit a ping pong ball. All right. So we're going to calculate what is the wavelength of this you know, particle slash wave of ping pong ball. All right. So this is the De Broglie equation. Now here's the problem. We have to be careful with the units, right? Because the Planck constant was given to us in joules times seconds. So we had to go back to the previous chapter where we defined what a joule is. And we said that a joule is a unit of energy that corresponds to the work done in moving a mass of one kilogram uh, 
over one meter at a one meter per second squared acceleration. So in other words, if we fix the units here, we end up, we can write the value of H in terms of kilograms times square meters per second, all right? So that's very important. The other thing is we have to then put the mass of this thing in kilograms and we have to put the speed in meters per second. Fortunately, they gave us that one already, but now we have to figure out what is 2.5 grams right in kilograms so let's see what that is so the mass in kilograms and the speed in meters per second so lambda would be again uh, Planck constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 again joule seconds but uh you saw here where we have the uh adjusted units right have them in there so let's write this out so 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 kilograms times meters squared per second divided by mass, which is 2.5 times 10 to the negative three uh, kilograms times 15.6 meters per second. So, uh, so the per seconds should cancel out, right? The meters should cancel out with the square meters here and the kilograms should cancel out with the kilograms there. So you should be left with units of meters. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and plug in the number. I'm not going to waste time doing the math. So what we have here is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 32 meters, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 23rd nanometers. Now, you all know that a nanometer is a very small amount, right? It's a, it's a, a billionth of a meter, right? So there you go. That is the wavelength of a ping pong ball. But you know what the problem is? Problem is, an atom is roughly about 0.1 nanometers size. You're talking about something that's like 22 orders of magnitude smaller than that. There is no device that could detect that kind of a wavelength. <clears throat> so the point is that even if matter does have these wave properties, we're not gonna see them in the macro world. You only see them in the atomic world. Why? Well, because this constant here with this 10 to the minus 34 in there can only be offset by a very, very small mass in here by something that's 10 to the minus 28, 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. And that's what subatomic particles are. So the only way to make this equation give me a wavelength that is reasonably detectable is if the particle is incredibly, incredibly small and light, okay? So that's pretty much the point here. So, of course, the question that comes up is, how do we prove it? H how can we show that this model is correct, right? So what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break, all right? And when we come back, uh, we're gonna tackle that question. What is the proof that electrons do behave as waves all right so we'll do that when we come back and uh so you can do whatever you want right now if you want to get some water or something to eat or have a comfort break uh but uh what i'm gonna do for you is i'm gonna leave here a video if you guys want to watch it uh it's about five minutes long it's about the physics of a guitar so you're welcome to stick around and watch it. I'll start it in a couple of minutes and then we'll watch it and we'll put it on for the remainder of the break, okay? So here we go. We'll start in a little bit. Hendrix, Cobain, and Page. They can all shred, but how exactly do the iconic contraptions in their hands produce notes, rhythm, melody, and music? 
When you pluck a guitar string, you create a vibration called a standing wave. Some points on the string, called nodes, don't move at all, while other points, antinodes, oscillate back and forth. The vibration translates through the neck and bridge to the guitar's body, where the thin and flexible wood vibrates, jostling the surrounding air molecules together and apart. These sequential compressions create sound waves, and the ones inside the guitar mostly escape through the hole. They eventually propagate to your ear, which translates them into electrical impulses that your brain interprets as sound. The pitch of that sound depends on the frequency of the compressions. A quickly vibrating string will cause a lot of compressions close together, making a high-pitched sound, and a slow vibration produces a low-pitched sound. Four things affect the frequency of a vibrating string. The length, the tension, the density, and the thickness. Typical guitar strings are all the same length and have similar tension, but vary in thickness and density. Thicker strings vibrate more slowly, producing lower notes. Each time you pluck a string, you actually create several standing waves. There's the first fundamental wave, which determines the pitch of the note, but there are also waves called overtones, whose frequencies are multiples of the first one. All these standing waves combine to form a complex wave with a rich sound. Changing the way you pluck the string affects which overtones you get. If you pluck it near the middle, you get mainly the fundamental and the odd multiple overtones, which have antinodes in the middle of the string. If you pluck it near the bridge, you get mainly even multiple overtones and a twangier sound. The familiar Western scale is based on the overtone series of a vibrating string. When we hear one note played with another that has exactly twice its frequency, its first overtone, they sound so harmonious that we assign them the same letter and define the difference between them as an octave. The rest of the scale is squeezed into that octave, divided into 12 half steps whose frequency is each 2 to the 1 12th power higher than the one before it. That factor determines the fret spacing. Each fret divides the string's remaining length by 2 to the 1 12th power, making the frequencies increase by half steps. Fretless instruments like violins make it easier to produce the infinite frequencies between each note, but add to the challenge of playing in tune. The number of strings and their tuning are custom tailored to the chords we like to play and the physiology of our hands. Guitar shapes and materials can also vary, and both change the nature and sound of the vibrations. Playing two or more strings at the same time allows you to create new wave patterns like chords and other sound effects. For example, when you play two notes whose frequencies are close together, they add together to create a sound wave whose amplitude rises and falls, producing a throbbing effect, which guitarists call the beats. And electric guitars give you even more to play with. The vibrations still start in the strings, but then they're translated into electrical signals by pickups and transmitted to speakers that create the sound waves. Between the pickups and speakers, it's possible to process the wave in various ways to create effects like distortion, overdrive, wah-wah, delay, and flanger. And lest you think that the physics of music is only useful for entertainment, consider this. Some physicists think that everything in the universe is created by the harmonic series of very tiny, very tense strings. So might our entire reality be the extended solo of some cosmic Jimi Hendrix? Clearly, there's a lot more to strings than meets the, uh, ear. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we'll be back in about five minutes. Okay, we are back and uh, we're going to try to finish this topic here today. So this is where we left. If you have any questions, just post them on the chat there and uh, I'll get to them in a few moments. Um, 
Okay, so um, the question was, what is the proof that at the atomic level, matter can behave as a wave? We know that if it does, we're not gonna see it in the macro world, as we saw with the example of the ping pong ball. But the, the key to answer the question came from another property of waves that we haven't discussed yet. And it's a phenomenon that is called wave diffraction. Wave diffraction. Uh, if you look at a beach like this one, where a wave breaker has been built, you can see that as the waves come in from the outside, from the ocean, and they go through this narrow opening, you can see where the originally, uh, what do you call that, linear wave, suddenly becomes like a radial one. It's like as the wave comes to a small opening, it kind of bends, so to speak, into these uh, radial or you know, semicircular kinds of waves. Well, light does the same thing. Uh, here's a little uh, illustration. Let's say that I have uh, uh, beams of light coming from left to right, and uh, the vertical lines here represent the uh, crests of these waves that are coming in in parallel. And you can see the distance between them as the wavelength lambda on the bottom. And let's say they hit a barrier, but in the barrier are two small slits. And those openings are about the same uh, size as the wavelength. So as you can see, when the light beams hit those slits, they undergo what we call diffraction. In other words, they kind of bend through those slits and generate a series of semicircular right, or radiating waves, all right? But notice that each slit generates a separate set of waves. And those waves are going to essentially encounter each other as they travel out uh, radially. Notice that at some points, these uh, waves are un gonna undergo a process called interference. If you look at the top picture here on the right, notice what happened there is that when the waves met, they were out of phase. So it was like crest to trough, crest to trough. And so essentially what they do is they cancel each other out. Now, because this was originally a wave of light, by having a flat line, that means there's no light there. And if you put a film in front there, you're gonna get uh, these dark bands in here. And that is what we call destructive interference. If on the other hand, the waves meet each other in phase, and you can see the bright little points here in this diagram, you see several uh, bright points in there. That means that the waves are meeting, you know, crest to crest and trough to trough, which means that they add up to each other and they generate a wave of bigger amplitude. And that translates into these light colored bands in the film. This is what we call constructive interference. So in other words, if I run a beam of particles, like it's in the bottom here, through a slit in a, bound, in a, in a wall, what's going to happen is most of the particles are essentially going to kind of like bounce off. Some of them are going to make it through. Now, they're going to make as linear. Some of them are going to collide with the edges here and kind of like get deviated. But if I were to put, let's say, a film here or a detector, what I'm gonna see essentially is, I'm gonna see like a, like a band there kind of in the middle, kind of smear where all the particles that made it through the slit actually hit. But if instead of a particle beam, what I have is waves, and I put over here a uh, detector, what I should see is the typical banding pattern of wave diffraction. So what, uh, you guys remember J.J. Thompson, who was the uh, guy who proposed the model of the atom, right? Uh, so basically his son, G.P. Thompson, and uh, other guys did this experiment. What they did was they took a beam of electrons, they ran it through a kind of like a barrier that had two slits in it, and they looked at the uh, pattern that you found on the other side. The idea was that if the electrons behave like particles, what you should get is two bright spots or kind of bands 
on the target or on the detector or film. But if the electrons behave like waves, what should happen is you should see an interference pattern. In other words, you should see the banding pattern that you get from waves diffracting when they go through a system of two slits. Well, guess what they found? That's what they found. That was the experiment that showed that electrons do behave as waves when they're exposed to the right environment. But there was one problem with the experiment. What they wanted to do was they wanted to see, well, what does this look like? What is the electron actually doing? What does the electron look like? So what they try to do was they try to put some other detector here at the slit, right? So they could see what exactly was uh, going through and what, what was going on. What was the electron look like as it passed through that slit? And when they did that, the pattern they obtained was, again, the particle pattern they no longer could see the wave pattern. It's as though the attempt to observe the electrons as they travel through these slits changed their behavior back into particle behavior. So that was a very, very uh, daunting uh, observation to explain until along came Heisenberg. Yes, no, not that Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg, who proposed the following. What he said was that, let's say that I have an electron going in a certain path. Anytime I try to observe it, essentially what I'm doing is I am putting a photon in there. And just like in the photoelectric effect that Einstein had explained, the photon actually knocks the electron off course. It changes its momentum. And therefore, at this point, it no longer behaves as a wave. It's behaving as a particle that knocked got knocked off course. Now the photon itself also gets scattered and so you have uh, no possible way of actually observing this uh, electron as it travels there, right? <clears throat> so what Heisenberg uh, got out of this was the following. Not only does it tell me that I cannot observe the electron behaving as a wave, it tells me that I can do one or the other. I can observe the effects of the wave behavior of an electron, such as the interference pattern that we saw, or I can observe the effects of the particle behavior of an electron, such as, for example, in an electrical current, but I cannot observe both at the same time. So the, both the wave properties, which were proven by the experiment, and the particle properties, which were known from you know, classical physics, exist, but they cannot be observed at the same time. And this is a one way of looking at what is called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And what I have here is an equation that shows it. Now, guys, I don't need you to know this equation. And uh, you may get a problem question in your homework where they have you do calculations with it. Uh, I don't need you to do that. I just want you to know what this means. So basically, in this equation, uh, delta x would be the uncertainty in the position of a particle, and delta v would be the uncertainty in the velocity of the particle. Um, remember that we said that in these uh, arrangements for the wave properties of electrons, we basically assume that you know the velocity is determined by the wavelength uh, or something like that. But you know it's usually going to have to do with the, the wavelength and the mass of the electron. Uh, M is the mass in kilograms, and H is, again, Planck's constant, uh, adjusted in units to kilograms times meters squared per second, all right? Uh, so essentially, if we look at it just from a simple ratio thing, notice what this is telling me is that the uncertainty in the position is in, let me see if I can, I can write here, is inversely related to the uncertainty in the velocity. So in other words, if I wanted to narrow down the position of the electron, kind of like pinpoint its location, kind of the way I do when I do a stop motion video of a baseball being thrown by a pitcher, and I can see, I can track 
its uh, path all the way through every step of the way. If I wanted to do that with an electron, what's going to happen is I am going to generate a tremendous uncertainty in its velocity, essentially in its wave-like properties. If, on the other hand, I try to decrease, to minimize that uncertainty in the velocity, in other words, in the wave properties of the electron, I'm going to lose all kinds of certainty with respect to the electron's position. So the point here by Heisenberg was that uh, going back to the Bohr model, the reason why it doesn't work is because it is proposing that electrons are traveling in these very well-defined orbits, right? And although it is true that they have discrete values of energy, you cannot do what you do with planets in the solar system where you can actually predict where each planet is going to be on this day of this month of this year because the electron is not circling around the nucleus. The electron is not like a planet orbiting the sun. The electron does not have a fixed position. The electron is simply an oscillating charge slash mass thing that's somewhere in there within the confines of that atom. And we can never exactly pinpoint either its position or its path. And any model that pretends to pinpoint any one of those values for the electron is going to fail because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. All right? Cool. So uh, I'm going to leave it there because what's going to happen next is that this guy, Erwin Schrodinger, was going to come up with a way of solving all this dilemma. All right? So I'm going to pause it here. Come back over here and uh, let me see if anybody has any questions. I know we are kind of like going some, you know, mind blowing stuff in here, but that is exactly what quantum mechanics was all about. All right. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, either put it on the chat room or, you know, you can unmute your microphone and let me know. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and start switching to our other presentation here. All right. Getting it ready for our next round here and see how far we can get. All right. All right. Let me get it ready here for us. All right. Okay, well, the good news is that uh, I don't think we're going to do any more calculations, any more heavy duty algebra like that. Okay, so that's the good news. It's all going to be here on our PowerPoint. But this is, as you realize, a different set. This is the next chapter. And I think this comes up to be chapter nine of TRO now. Uh, I keep losing track of these things because every edition that he makes, he changes the chapter numbers. And of course, it makes it kind of like a little hard to deal with. All right. So, sorry, I was kind of distracted here getting my stuff ready. Am I still recording? Oh, man, I should have paused the recording. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's keep on going. We're going to go for another, you know, another 30 minutes or so. And uh, actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new recording here. All right, so uh, we will stop this one here because this is a different.